Have you ever really read the Christmas story and studied the life and ministry of Jesus and looked at him outside of um, the mindset of, you know, Jesus and the disciples or, or Jesus, you know, and, you know, all the other elements that went on during his time on earth, but looked at him as Jesus and his family and his family? I mean, what was the family life of Jesus like? So let's talk about that for a few moments. Obviously, it began with a carpenter named Joseph and a young woman named Mary. And the Bible doesn't say how they met, maybe in a Middle Eastern diner. I don't know, maybe at a carpenter's trade show. We, we just don't know, but, but they meet and they fall in love. Their love grows, excitement grows, and finally they get engaged. And this is a, a very good time, especially in that culture where engagement festivities are just off the chain, crazy, crazy good. So just when it looked like their relationship could, you know, I, I was able to keep going even with that distraction. Y'all should give me an applause for that. <laughs> Only Bill Wade could pull that off. Lord Jesus. You got to know Bill to really appreciate that. But when it looked like their relationship couldn't even get any better, all of a sudden does that the ups and downs, this roller coaster ride that all families seem to go through uh, in some form, certainly not to this degree, but in some form. And Joseph views it as a disaster. From out of nowhere, Mary comes and she tells him that she's pregnant. Now, he thought of Mary as a very virtuous, uh, good virgin girl. And he knew that he had not been intimate with her, and now she's telling him that she's pregnant. Things have gone from a good season to a bad season. A good life to a bad life. In his mind, this engagement is pretty much over. Wouldn't it have been for most of you? I mean, in in their mind, it's off. But Mary is quick to respond to Joseph's brokenness and of her apparent betrayal of their relationship. And she lets him know, it's not another man. I conceived birth to to the Messiah. And he's like, okay, you know, if that's how you feel. But he still, he decides to not shame her publicly, even though he's not fully committed to her story. And he, he's going to quietly walk away from his commitment to take her as his wife. He's in shock, so he decides to sleep on it first. Man, that's a great thing. You know, before we open our big mouths and make a public declaration, sometimes it would be good to sleep on it, wouldn't it? Look at the person sitting next to you and say, hey, sleep on it. Just sleep on it. That's great advice. Well, that night an angel, as Joseph is sleeping on it, an angel appears in a dream and says, I know what Mary told you seems unlikely, but what she told you is, in fact, the truth. The child in her womb was conceived by the Holy Ghost. She's about to give birth to the Messiah, the Savior of the world. So Joseph, he opens his eyes the next morning, and he decides to trust his dream. He decides to trust God and to trust Mary and stay in this relationship. Well, time passes, and Mary gives birth in Bethlehem to the Savior of the world. Pretty exciting start for a family of three, right? I mean, that's pretty pretty exciting. Because on the night Jesus was born, there were angelic choirs, a special star that navigated guests from the east, and, and just all kind of extra elements that we didn't have when our babies were born, right? This was obviously the high point so far. This was a great season in their family. It was a very good time. And they're thinking, wow, it's just going to get better. It started so strong. But again, that's not how it played out. Remember what happened next? The Bible tells us, and history says, that King Herod hears the rumor that another king has been born, and he's intimidated by that. And he, he orders the slaughter of thousands of young baby boys to protect his throne. Well, Mary and Joseph get kind of a, a heads up on this, and they make a break for Egypt. And this family of three are on the run from an insecure, lunatic king. And it's, it was really a bad time. It was a very scary, scary low point in their family's history. They stayed in Egypt until King Herod died and until they felt like the threat was over. And they think it's probably safe to go home, but they're still a little leery about going all the way back to Jerusalem. So they moved to an idyllic little town called Nazareth. And the best I can tell from scriptures, again, they, they've gone from a very dark season to a very high season and a happy time again in Jesus' family. Did you know that Jesus had siblings? Uh, we have the name of four of his brothers in the Bible, and he, you know, most scholars tell us that he probably had sisters as well. And it was, it was a fairly large family that Jesus was a part of. And again, from what we see in scripture, this was a very happy time in their family. 
All indications say that it was a happy family time in Nazareth, culminating when Jesus was 30 years old and was baptized in the Jordan River. Now, the scriptures say upon his baptism, the heavens split and a voice came out of the heavens, the voice of God that said, this is my beloved son and I love him. Listen to him. So God authenticated the identity of his son with a voice from heaven. And again, it was a good time. And you would think, awesome, this is incredible. God authenticates Jesus, so certainly all is going to get well and be even better from this point moving forward. But again, the story takes a turn. In fact, maybe the lowest point in the family life of Jesus happens shortly after his baptism. Jesus comes out and he starts proclaiming that he's the Son of God, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. And people, they push back on that. They go absolutely ballistic. We know who you are. You grew up on our block. You work in a carpenter shop. You're not the Messiah. You're you're just a kid like all the rest of us in this neighborhood. And people are very upset about his claim to be the Messiah, the Savior of the world. It was a bad time. There was a revolt. It It was a big pushback. So much so that his brothers and his mothers are standing outside of a home where Jesus is doing some incredible teaching, and they're trying to calm him down and reel him in a little bit. And they're saying, hey, go tell Jesus that, We need him to come out here and talk to his mother and his brothers. And somebody goes in and says, hey, your mother and your your brothers are here, and they want to talk to you. And he said, I have no mothers and brothers. These people are my family now. He's like, I know what they want. I ain't going out there to talk to them. I'm I'm doing the work of God. I'm I'm out here doing the work of God. So, So they finally talk him into coming out. They get him back to the house, and they say to Jesus, you can't go around saying things like this. And his brothers are like, we got to shut this down because people are, are angry. They're, they're going to try to kill you. And it was a bad season for the family of Jesus. But Jesus goes out and he teaches anyway. And as he does, what authenticates his teaching and his ministry and that he is, in fact, the Son of God are these incredible miracles that he starts doing everywhere he goes. When he starts healing the lame and giving blind, the blind sight, uh, when he feeds a multitude of people, when he calms a storm, when he raises someone from the dead, again, all of a sudden, there's this pinnacle, this, this high season in his life. These good times are starting to come back around. Now people are starting to say, hey, you know, maybe, maybe he is who he says he is, which culminates on Palm Sunday when all of Jerusalem turns out as Jesus comes into the city for Passover. And there's a parade for Jesus. And there's a lot of excitement and celebration. People are are waving palm branches and they're saying, Hail to the king of the Jews. Everybody's waving and and they're saying, He's the greatest. This was another high point. We've gone from a dark season to a very bright season, a, a devastating season to a very celebratory season. It was a very good time. And I imagine his family was in the front row of that parade. And they're also a part and they're going, Yeah, we're with him. You know, I'm his brother, I'm his sister, I'm his mom. We knew he, you, we, we've always known who he was, and we're just celebrating with everybody else. This was a very high point, a very good time, a time to celebrate family. But just a few days later, we're going to take yet another turn. Jesus was savagely beaten, and he was nailed to a cross. And there he is, bleeding and dying for the redemption of the world. And his mother Mary is standing at the foot of the cross, and she's watching her son die. People spitting on him and mocking and making fun of him. And I can't imagine watching my child or anyone else's for that matter go through crucifixion. I can think of nothing worse for parents than to stand by helpless and watch a child pass. So from a family perspective, this was, in fact, an all-time low, a really bad season. But the worst day was about to give way to the best day. For this family and all of history, three days later, he's back. He's back. The dark day of crucifixion turned into the bright day of resurrection. Jesus appears to over 500 family and friends for weeks, and and they're starting to think, awesome, we've got Jesus back, and we're not going to lose him again. This was a good time. It was a celebratory time. And then in Acts chapter 1, he ascends back to his Father in heaven. He disappears. They watch him at the transfiguration. They watch him go back to the Father. He's gone. And it had to be a really sad time when when they realized that You know, they weren't going to see him for a long, long time. And his family and his friends and his disciples had to be just devastated. He's gone. Thursday night, my mom had been here with us for about 10 days. And and, uh, it took about one day for her great-grandson, Lennox, to uh, adjust to her being here. And he... She would hold him in her lap, and she'd read books to him, and he'd turn the pages for her, and she just fell in love with him. And 
And uh, Thursday night was her last time to see him. She was going to get on a plane on Friday morning. And she stood there, and she cried, and she kissed on him, and she cried some more. And her last words uh, to him were, uh, don't forget me, I'm, I'm coming back, you know. Don't forget me, I'm coming back. And I got to thinking about that, and only my depraved mind could get a sermon out of that, okay? So, <laughs> you know, uh, Jesus is standing with his disciples, and his message is basically the same. I know you're sad, I know you're, you're upset, but don't forget, I am coming back. I am going to come back someday. And, and uh, I think that after he's gone, Mary and the brothers and sisters, they just go, holy cow, what was that? What a ride that was, but now he's gone. So I want us to take a time out for a second. Jesus, you know, just like Jesus' family, uh, every one of yours have highs and lows. Can you give affirmation to that? We go through good times and we go through bad times. Certainly different circumstances, but nonetheless, good times and bad times, celebrations that turn into devastations, right? There are many Crosspoint families right now who are in very painful seasons, very low points, things we're going really good, and you didn't see it coming. You were blindsided. The bottom fell out. Celebrations turned to devastation. Let me talk about it and spin this another way because I want to make my point. The family that I grew up in had a lot of ups and downs, highs and lows, and it shaped me. It formed me. It molded me. Uh, you know, there were some peaks. There were good times. There were some real, real high times. My dad pastored a church in Sanford, Florida, just about 22 miles from the front gates of Disney World. And I can remember we had so many church people that worked at Disney that we never paid to go to Disney. We'd go out there sometimes just for the evening, you know, just to when the crowds were thinning out, we'd go and just hit up rides and just enjoy the, the evening together and eat dinner out there somewhere. And those were great memories of my dad walking through Epcot and all those other places that we were a part of back in those days. I remember swimming in ice-cold mountain streams in North Georgia with my dad and my brother when we were, I was a, a little bit younger, a younger season of my life. I remember helping my dad paint cars, and I remember coming home from school. And my, my mother always had supper waiting for us on the stove, and it was kind of a potluck thing with her. And you knew it was there, and it was simmering, and you go by and fix your plate, and generally we'd go to eat together. And uh, sitting at my mother's table was a peak when I lived at home. It's still a blessing to sit at my mother's table. Uh, but good times often gave way to bad times in our family, just as it does in yours. Uh, when I was a little boy, my mother was diagnosed with cancer, and the doctors gave her six months to live. My dad was diagnosed with throat cancer, and that's about the worst thing that you can tell a preacher is that we're going to take your vocal cords and put a voice box in, and your preaching days are pretty much over. Those were bad, bad seasons. Those were low, low points. Living with my family through the peaks and valleys, the good and bad, had a forming effect on me, and it does for you too when your family goes through those highs and those lows. Amen? Yes. Now, I'm in another family now. I met this beautiful girl at summer church camp. She decided that she wanted me really bad. She wanted me enough that she broke off an engagement with another goober. I don't. That's all I can say about him. <laughs> um, yeah. And I was cool with that. She chased me for all of about 30 seconds. It just took a wink when I was up on the stage playing bass guitar. Two years later, we're walking down the aisle getting married. That was a really good, good time for us. We were launching our family. And then there were some more wonderful highs as things continued to unfold. Micah and, and Rissy came along. And it was an all-time high for us having those two babies come into our life. But then life started happening, as it often does for everybody in the room. Uh, next thing you know, our little boy is in the hospital and he's having a serious surgery. And then a couple of months after that, our little girl is being carted into a surgical uh, ward with, on a little red wagon. And, you know, it's nothing that will wrench your gut more than to watch your child, your baby, pulled through the operating room doors and she's looking back over her shoulder like, are you going to let this happen? You know, it just wrenches your guts, you know. And, and it was a really, really bad time. Some years later, we moved from South Georgia to Hope Mills, North Carolina to pastor a denominational church. Uh, and the church started to grow. That was a good time. That was a good time. So we're back up again. Then for reasons that were never fully explained to me, I was asked to leave that growing church. That was a bad time. 
a really low point in our family. And at that point, it was the lowest of lows. Then my family launched Cross Point Church. It wasn't easy, but it was a really good time. And I, I, I loved on... It was a great time. I, I look around and I see a couple of charter members in the room that were with us, uh, even in the denominational church. And, and uh, a new baby came in today for the first time that I got to see. And I didn't get to touch the baby because I've shaken so many hands and y'all have all these germs. And, you know... <laughs> So I, I told her, I said, I can't love on the baby because all these church people give me all these cooties, and, and I can't do that, you know. So, uh, but I'll get to do that. But I've watched her, that baby's mother grow up, and she's in the room today. And, uh, you know, it's a great thing to... We celebrated some good times, and our charter members can tell you, we, we went, it was not easy, but we went through some really great, great times together. Uh, it, was, it was a wonderful thing. And then I'll remember calling my dad around 2009 after we'd been going about five years here, and uh, I, I told my dad, I said, you know, we're finally getting out of these rental buildings and, and uh, we're finally going to close on a lawn and we're going to start construction on this new church. It's going to begin pretty soon. My dad was so excited. He was already in bad health, but he drove over and I showed him the plans. The plans had just come off the drawing board and, and we talked about details and he, he gave me, you know, just this great affirmation. And then just a few months after that, on November the 9th, a short time after sharing all this good news with my pop about the church, I stood beside his hospital bed rubbing his forehead as he took and drew his last breath. That was a horrible, horrible day in our family. Ups and downs, highs and lows, good times and bad times, celebrations and devastations all along the way. Can you identify? How we deal with the peaks and the valleys forms us, and it forms the lives of our children. Jesus' story was a family story, and so is yours. Everyone in the room could stand up here and you could share the timeline of celebrations that turned to devastations and then back up again of how your family has played this out. Everyone in the room could do that, highs and lows, and talk about it. So let me ask you this question. How much do you value your family's story? How important is it? On the anniversary of 9-11 this year, I read an in-depth report of the last 15 minutes of Flight 93. Uh, the one where the hijackers took over the plane and it was crashed in the fields. Lot, lots of phone calls were made. And I listened to some of those, but lots of phone calls were made from the plane before it crashed. The records show that not one call was made to the office when they knew they had 15 minutes to live. Not one call went to the stockbroker. Not one. But they all called family. They called their husbands, their wives, their sons, their daughters, their parents. When you come to the end of the road, lying in a hospital bed or even maybe in your own home, it will be family that surrounds you. That's what our story really is. That's, that's how our story really, really is happening. There are more than a, a few cross-pointers who are facing the holiday season where celebration has turned to devastation. Someone is missing for the first time that has always been there, and this year they're not with you anymore. And for everybody else in the room, I promise you this. If you were to ask the people that are enduring a season all alone without that person that they've lost, if if you were to ask them about dark days and bad times, they'd be quick to say to everyone else in the room, don't wait for something like this to happen before you place a really high value and priority on your family. Don't, don't wait for tragedy to strike. In, in fact, my vote is for everyone in the room to decide today before you walk out those doors to put family back as priority and regain perspective to what we know that it should be. These days, dad and mom are off to work slugging out a living from early morning to late e- evening. A, a host of kids are in school environments that are very high-risk environments. And when most families reassemble at home every evening, they're absolutely depleted. On empty, in survival mode, in security, love, and admiration for one another, it takes a big, big, big hit because of all the distractions that are going on in the home. And the family is in a very hostile environment, and it's being battered, and unimaginable damage is being done in the home today, quite often because everybody's running on low fuel. And then the debate kicks in. Well, whose job is it to fill the tank? You know, I mean, who's supposed to do that? And when you ask that question, and sometimes I've asked it in counseling sessions with families, 
whose job is it? And who, who's got the assignment in this family to, to tend to the needs and to replenish the, you know, those that are depleted, to breathe life and energy and joy and love and security and affection into the rest of the family? Whose responsibility is that? How did it, how did it work in the family you grew up in? Because we all kind of assigned it to somebody. Whose job was it in the family to fill those tanks? You'd say, well, that was kind of mom's job. She always stepped up and did that and kept us motivated and kept us going. Or that was dad's job. He kind of shouldered the burden and the responsibility. But it was always somebody else. It was never my place, right? I mean, surely not me. Well, God has a point of view on this too. And I want you to lean into this because this is for every person in the room. God has a point of view on this. And and I think that we need to lean into it. Do you know what it is? God's point of view is this. He assigns everybody in the family that responsibility. Everybody in the the family the responsibility of filling up other family members when things get low. He does. He assigns equal responsibility to all of us in the room. If you read the scriptures, it says in Ephesians 5 that it's the job of a husband. Ephesians 5 said, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loves the church. The highest standard of love that we know in the universe is the kind of love that Jesus expressed when he shed his blood for his people who would ultimately become his church, right? Here's the summation of Ephesians 5, and I gave the boys back there a break today. Usually I'll have 30 or 40 slides, and I figured, Merry Christmas to you. You can just sit back and enjoy today, and, you know, I'm paraphrasing some of the scriptures anyway. But I'm I'm using Ephesians 5 and 6 if you want to go home and read that a little bit later. But here's the summation of Ephesians 5. He said, Fathers, dads, husbands... It's your job, your your job, your assignment from heaven to take responsibility to fill the emotional tank of your spouse and your children, to breathe life and love and joy and confidence into them every day. That is your job, fellas. Don't, Don't push away from it. Don't say, I'm not really prepared because you can get prepared. Don't say, I'm no good at it because you can get good at it. Dads, husbands, fathers, we've got to take this responsibility very, very seriously, as is, is, it is assigned to us in the Scriptures. Uh, do for your family what Christ has already done and is still doing for the church. Then just a few verses later, it says this. Wives, it's your responsibility to fill up, to love, to support, to encourage, affirm, respect, breathe life, and encouragement into your husband. It's your job, even if he's not doing it for you. It's your job to make sure you provide that for him and all the others in your family dynamic. And then the Bible says a curious thing. It says in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, Now, parents, as a team, you too have a job. It's put in the negative, but it makes, it makes a better impact to do it in the negative. It says one of your job is to make sure you don't do this. It's to make sure that you don't provoke your children to a life filled with anger and rage. And let me show you how to unpack that and how that looks. The pressure on kids in our culture and society today is is crazy. I mean, there's, uh, there's no better way to say it. It's just absolutely crazy, the pressure that they have to fit in, to stand out, or to excel, or to achieve. Tremendous, tremendous pressure. And they get that, you know, by... By the time that they they get back to their homes, uh, in many cases, they've taken an emotional beating throughout their their day anyway, or they've they've been on unsteady soil, to say the least. They get home, and and sometimes parents, they, they get home, and their tanks are empty too. So they start turning the screws sometimes. You know, the parents who's just depleted, they start turning the screws on their kids. And it's things like this. What's the matter with you? Why why didn't you do this? Why don't you do that? Why don't you ever? Some some years ago, somebody that attended Cross Point Church butt-dialed me. (laughs) Have you ever butt-dialed anybody? And then, you know, you just realize it and you're like, oh, my God, what did they hear? Yeah, Uh, we've all done that. But this this mother butt-dialed me, and she had a carload of kids, and, man, I had no idea that that was the environment that they lived in. Uh, she railed on those kids. There was cursing. I mean, these were really young kids. And I'm like, oh, my God, this is horrible. And, and, and uh, it, was, it was actually left on my voicemail. And I sat there, and I'm, I'm not going to lie, I listened to the whole thing. Because it, it changed my perspective. And it, it, it didn't cause me to push them out. It caused, caused me to want to pull them in because they needed help. They needed help to fix this broken thing in their family. And it was just, it was a devastating thing. 
Um, the Bible says, whatever you do, don't provoke your kids to anger. You've got to convince them. The one safe place that they can always come back to is the family, where there's, where there's going to be open arms and love and acceptance. This, this house is going to be a filling station where you can say, I'm going to fill your tanks up, not deplete them. Then the Bible says, kids, kids, listen. You're not supposed to just be hanging around doing nothing. Kids, honor your father. Holla back. Kids, honor your father and your mother. Be respectful. Be cooperative. Be loving. Be encouraging to the parents. All of that is found in Ephesians chapter 6. But listen, parents, you have to train that. You have to train that. You can't just hope that they pick it up someday. But when, when the kids are old enough and can assume responsibility for that, then children need to provide honor, respect, cooperation, love, and encouragement. Are you tracking? What's the vision here? The vision from God's perspective is that everyone in the family assumes responsibility for filling up everyone else in the family. Now, some of you are saying, okay, maybe I'll assume responsibility for filling the tanks of the others in my, my family. Maybe I will. What does that look like? How do I do it? I want to help you with that too. Have you ever walked into a room and you sensed immediately that the environment was just, there was so much tension and so much strain in the room and it was just down, it was low, it was a dark environment, it was bad, really, really bad. And you thought, how can I bless everybody in the room? How can I pick everybody up? How do I fill up all these empty tanks and make a difference here? How do I move from a low point to a really high point? Let me give you something simple that, that will, in fact, work. And I may not get to finish this and say everything that I wanted to say, but I'll do my best. Three ways to fill up empty tanks is a look, a word, or a touch. Let's unpack that a little bit. Uh, a look, a word, or a touch. Let's think about it for a second. You've heard the old adage that if looks could kill. We'll finish that. Because if looks could kill, there would be bodies everywhere. Dead bodies, right? Did you know that a single look of disdain or, or disrespect or shame can take a kid or a spouse from a full tank to an empty tank just like that? One look, no words exchanged. I've seen spouses do this to each other in social settings just devastate their spouse. I've seen parents do it uh, to kids, uh, you know, give them that look that I, I just like to beat you. I'm going to slap the t- I'm going to, I'm going to, mm. you know, I've seen that look without saying a word. Uh, I've seen kids do it to parents. You ever had your kid roll their eyes at you when you spoke to them? Oh, uh-uh. uh-uh. Not in my house. They may have done it when they turned to walk away, but they never did it to my face. Uh, I mean, these looks, you know, it's a look of disrespect. Hey, you can go from celebration to devastation in a moment. But let's flip this. A single look filled with love and joy and delight in others. A loving look can take someone who's riding on fumes and fill their tank back up. My dad, as I told you last week, was a phenomenal paint and body man. And I remember uh, I was in this, uh, I started to say a work release program. That's not exactly what it was. <laughs> <laughs> You would believe that, but that's not true. But I was uh, in this after-school work program where I got to leave early every day and would go and had on-the-job training, you know. And, and so my dad ran a paint, paint and body shop for one of our church members that had a big junkyard, and they were flipping cars all the time and doing stuff. And so I worked in the body shop with my dad. And my dad would let me prime cars, you know, sand them down, prime them, tape them up, and do a little bit of body work. He always had to come back and touch that stuff up. Uh, but he'd let me prime cars because it was really hard to screw up priming a car. And those of you that have ever had any paint and body experience, you know it's really hard to mess up primer. And even if it runs a little bit, you sand it right back out. So anyway, uh, my dad, the phone rings in the shop, and he's over there on the phone, and he's ordering materials for the next job, and it's time to paint the bed of a pickup truck. And he always painted the bed and under the hood and the door jams and all that stuff first. And, and uh, he, he hands me the paint gun. He's already mixed a can, you know, the paint and put it in the can, and he says, start in the bed. And I'm like... I've never done this before. He said, you can do it. You, you've, you know, you got experience with the primer. Go ahead. It's the same thing. So I start spraying the bed, and, and my dad's on the phone, and he's watching. He's watching every move I make, and he's, he's just watching me, and, and he's giving me a few nods every now and then. I finally get the first coat on. I've covered everything. He didn't have to tell me, go back and hit this spot or that spot or anything like that. I finally step out of the bed, and I spray the tailgate as it's laying flat, and I step back and spray the jams inside the tailgate, and I look over at my dad. He's still on the phone, and he goes, 
I never forgot that look. You know why? Because I got it the day that he came and he looked at the plans for this church. It was like, awesome. It was just a look. He didn't have to say anything. It was just a look. There's a lot of power in a look. And it can be just as devastating depending on the kind of look that you give. Let me unpack that. Jesus was arrested and about to be unjustly crucified. A young girl recognized Peter in the courtyard. Peter curses and denies Jesus three times. And this is recorded in Luke 22. Jesus looked at Peter after Peter had denied him, the Bible says. And it says, and then Peter went out after that look and he wept bitterly. And I was wondering what kind of look would have caused that kind of reaction from Peter. The Bible doesn't tell us, but if I could put myself in that story, I would think it would be something like this. I think Peter remembered was what Jesus told him just hours earlier, before all this started unfolding. Before Jesus said, before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me. You're going to denounce me three times. Lord, I would never deny you. I would never walk away from this relationship. And Jesus was like, oh, Peter, don't. Don't because you're going to feel so bad when your weakness is exposed in the denials that are coming. Peter remembered that when Jesus gave him the look. And I think the look that Jesus gave Peter because of what happened for the rest of the story was not the look you might think that caused him to weep, but in fact just the opposite of what you might be inclined to believe on the front end. I think Jesus' look said this to Peter. You see, Peter, that's what I was trying to tell you, and it's okay. I still love you. Don't beat yourself, up, beat yourself up over this. I still love you enough to cover this denial. Peter didn't know that there was enough love for denials like that, and it changed him. And I think that that was the turning point in Peter's life because ultimately he became the martyr that said, I can't even die the same way Jesus did, right? And I don't want to do that. So every time you come around your family members, you can fill them up or, you know, with looks of love and affirmation and confidence and joy and delight with just a look, or you can wreck them. And you make that choice. Every one of us makes that choice several times a day. Let me try to get one more in here at least. What, what about words? Of course we know the power of words. Words can be very strong. And I remember when I was at one of those low points in my life, In ministry, someone left an anonymous letter under an office door, and I'd just gotten reamed out in a boardroom, and I knew things were quickly coming to an end, but the the letter, the note, was just four lines, and it said this, You're a wonderful pastor. You've helped my family more than you'll ever know. Your future is bigger than this problem. Keep moving forward. That anonymous note filled my empty tank. It's a powerful thing, the power of words. The three words that that have power to fill up empty tanks more than any others, what's the the most powerful three words in our English vocabulary? I love you. We've made it a a very prominent part. of. It's a staple in our family. My kids are grown and have their own families, and we hardly go away from each other or talk on the phone that we don't say, I love you. And y'all think, Micah, you know, he's kind of tough and rugged. He's a big baby. He's watching today. He loves on his daddy, and he'll give me kisses and... You know, he's just a sap, just a sap. But there's a lot of love that runs through our family. Let's talk about touch real quick. Massive amounts of love can be conveyed through just a touch. No words, no looks sometimes, just a touch. Jesus knew this. He did a lot of healing. In fact, Jesus could have done drive-by healings, just kind of waved, you know, the Benny Hinn thing. Whoosh, everybody's, you know. He could have done that. But he didn't because he valued personal touch. So he, he stopped and he touched a lot of people. And, and they reached out to touch him just as a woman did that touched the hem of his garment. Touch was so, so valuable. And there's a story I have to leave out because it went a little bit beyond PG in the first service and I almost didn't get it back. So I'm, I'm going to just say here, I'm done. Okay? Here's the summation. If you want to deal with holiday stress, especially when your family is running on empty, you can replenish your home with a look, a word, or a touch. And you've got to start somewhere. Start start there. Start right here. The determining factor is what you do with what you just heard. Will you value family through the highs and lows? Will you accept your assignment to be the one who fills the empty tanks of everybody else in the room? This is for moms and dads and sons and daughters. You all have an assignment. You've got to start somewhere. Will you give loving looks and words and touch to your family? There are some people that are struggling, man, in this season because of 
devastating losses. And my heart is broken for you because I, I've never seen so much pain and loss, especially towards the end of a season, right before Thanksgiving and holidays and one funeral after another. One family in our church has had two funerals in one week, of very close family members. And my heart's broken for people that are struggling this way. Um, I, wanted to, I wanted to give you something to kind of start the season the right way. I wanted the atmosphere to be festive because people are going, and we so many people at Crosspoint, there, there's so many people here that are trying so hard to just take it one day at a time. And I want you to get this, okay? Because you're wondering right now in this deepest, most dire pain, can I get through this devastation? Here's the takeaway, and I hope you'll take it. I hope you'll walk out of here with it. It's devastating today. It's a low point. It's a dark place. It's a, it's a downtime. But I promise you this. Simple strategy. I know the tank is empty, and I know there's a lot of pain, a lot of hurt. But I believe in the principle of sowing and reaping. You put something in, you get something out. So in your pain and your hurt, I know it's hard, a lot to ask. But for the rest of your family that's going through the same thing, pour into them a little bit right now. You know, with a look, a touch, or a word. Just pour into them. Be, be strategic about how you do it. And then reap that from your family because they'll lean back into you and they'll do the same thing, especially if they're in the room because I'm giving them an assignment. And let's take the devastation and for a season that you think I cannot celebrate, I cannot move through this time, it's just it's too bad, and I, I just want to close the doors and, you know, close the blinds and, and turn all the lights off and sit in this dark place and get through it on my own, my own way. Don't do it. Don't give in to that. Turn the lights on. Decorate the tree. Put pre- presents under there. I mean, do it all. Put the blow-up Santas, them, you know, them tacky blow-up Santas on the roof. You know, my brother does this. I love you, bro. Do whatever it takes to jumpstart a celebration and change the devastation. And then a touch, a look, a word. Speak it into the hearts of the people. Start there, and if you do, the dark days will begin to turn bright again. The devastation become, becomes celebration again. The lows will give way to highs, the bad to good, and that's what we're praying for. For you, I love you guys. I do, I love you guys. I think that those of you that have been around long enough, you know that we love you and we're going to try to help you through these dark places. But we can't, we can't pull you out. You've got to be willing to step out. Um, and that's, that's up to you. I'm just giving you just a simple look because there's a lot of theology here, okay? And I don't want to... I don't want to overwhelm you with theology, so we try to keep it simple here. But a look, a touch, or a word will go a long way. You pour it into somebody, and you reap what you sow, they'll pour it back into you, and it'll lift you up out of that dark season. And God will turn the light on, and we need the light to be turned on. Amen? You need it. There's there's a lot of people that need the light turned back on. They're hurting today. Serious, serious pain. And I pray for you, and I'm going to pray for you right now. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Father, restore that which is lost. Restore the darkness by turning the light on. Help the people that came in here burdened and broken and battered. Their souls are busted. I pray in Jesus' name that you'll do it. God, that you'll show up in a powerful, powerful way. And we'll give you the praise, the honor, and the glory for it in Jesus' name.